So when God made Adam, he gave him certain characteristics, certain traits. He made him a certain way to do certain things. And he proclaims him good. But then Adam falls into sin. His image is marred. His purpose is destroyed. He dies now. He now has sin. He has to be fixed. He has to be redeemed. So God could punish Adam, get rid of him, and get rid of the devil and everybody. But the claim that could be made, possibly, is like, okay, I'm the serpent, I'm the devil, God, you can kill, you can do whatever you want, but the things that you claim about this creature are not true. See, the image of God in Adam has been misrepresented. So in Christ, being man, God reinstates that claim. He recapitulates Adam in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, there's a purpose now. He is to exert dominion. Adam was created to exert dominion. He failed. Christ comes and he exerts dominion. He triumphs. Adam was given a woman, Eve, to help him. Christ has a bride, the church, who helps him. Adam was told to be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. He failed. Christ, from the upper room down to today, in the upper room in the book of Acts, 120 people, has been fruitful and multiplying ever since and subduing the earth little by little as more and more people come to Christ throughout history and all the nations of the world. He is succeeding, right? He's recapitulating. He is reinstituting everything that Adam lost. And so... The reason why all these doctrines that we say we believe are important is because they all follow logically from that. The reason why we can have peace in Christ is because he became flesh and dwelt among us. Because if he didn't become flesh and dwelt among us, then he would never be undefeated like Ray says. The reason why we can have peace of whatever happened in the world is because in becoming man triumphing over the devil triumphing over death and Hades, destroying our worst enemy which is death he has freed us from the thing that had us bound and now we can live knowing that the worst thing that can happen to any of us is we die and if we die we go with Jesus so the worst thing that can happen is that we die <laughs> And when we die, we live more than we did when we were alive. <laughs> you see what I mean? See that? That happens because he became flesh. Because every human soul that died before Christ was claimed by Sheol. Hades is called. Sheol is in the Old Testament. Hades is in the New Testament. The place of death. The Old Testament saints, everybody went there. The Old Testament saints were in a little air conditioning, air conditioned room partition away, but they all went there, awaiting, awaiting who? The Messiah. I was talking to my wife the other day, and I pointed out, if you think about it, John the Baptist was beheaded before Christ died. So he was still under the Old Testament. He was still under the Old Covenant. So he was a forerunner here, but he was a forerunner there, because he went down, and he's like, Moses, Abraham, it's happening. It's happening. I just came back. I just came from over there. They chopped my head off. It doesn't matter. I came down. I'm telling you, wait a little more. It's happening. It's about to, it's about to come down. And when Christ died, he was claimed. That's why he went down. But who went down was not some guy named Jesus, was the second divine person, the logos, the word, life, went down to death and destroyed death. We call that the harrowing of hell. Christ went down, life went down, and brought his people. That's why now we don't go down. Because he has the keys to death and Hades. He got it when he went down. So, in Psalm chapter 2, the reason I want to tell you this, all of this, 
is because in the second psalm, we're told, we're told that God has a king in Zion, right? And if you go, I didn't read uh, verse 8, he says, ask of me, this is the father speaking to the son, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. That means that the world belongs not only to him, but that everything that is happening in the world is to fulfill that purpose. The nations were Adam's, right? I mean, he's the father of us all. Adam lost that. Christ accomplished that. And the father tells the son, ask, and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. What nations? Whatever nations there are. And the ends of the earth for your possession. Remember what Adam was told. Be fruitful. Multiply. Subdue the earth. Exert dominion. Cultivate. Build. Reflect my glory. Fill this earth. Adam failed. Well, he succeeded in filling the earth. Probably the only commandment we've ever kept, right? Fulfill the earth. <laughs> Fill the earth. Have babies. The only commandment we've ever obeyed, right? But, and he was given a woman to help him, Eve. But remember, that image of God in Adam was misrepresented, and Christ recapitulates it. He reinstates it. So in Christ, he exerts dominion. He subdues the earth, and he spreads out, and he has a bride that helps him doing that. The church. She's been doing that since the beginning. The church has had a lot of children since the 120. So why is this important? The reason why this is important is because you need to realize, and in our day this is very important, that when you see things happening geopolitically in the world, movements of nations and countries and empires going up and down, understand that none of that is by accident. All of that is God working the world for the purposes of, number one, expanding his kingdom, and number two, growing his church. The church has grown throughout history in the rise and falls of empires and nations and regions. So nothing that you see happening is random chance that is just happening that we have to be worried about. We're living today probably through some of the most important times, probably, in our lives. Because we are in the middle of, a, of course, the news are not going to tell you that. But we're living in a, in, a, in a moment of transition, right? The world is transitioning over to another order of things, right? We, we all grew up, um, well, my father in that generation grew up in the, in the Cold War. I remember the Cold War, you had, you had two powers. You had the Soviet Union and then you had the United States and everybody else kind of hovered around one of those two, you know, China, Vietnam or whatever, and over here you had Canada and Western Europe or whatever. And then you had the, uh, everybody else. It's called the third world. So you have one world, another world, and the third world. That's where I grew up, right? We're just the, the nobodies. So, 1991, I think it was, Soviet Union collapses, and now we have a unipolar world. We have only one power, United States. Everybody hovers or subordinates to the United States or you're over here, I don't know, you're the third world, you're sanctioned or whatever. That has, that's the world that I grew up in. That's the world, 1991, all the way up until February of this year. Because in February of this year, the Russians invaded Ukraine and they began the end of the unipolar world where only one nation has claims that are valid because 
we would like to stop the thing in Ukraine, we figure out that we really can't. So you have another power. And there are other powers growing. You, know, you got China, you got India, you got all these other nations. So we're looking at the beginning of a multipolar world where nations are going to have stakes and they might cancel each other out. And that may sound scary to some people. It's not. You know why there was a bipolar world? You know why there was the Soviet Union in the United States? You know why that happened? You know, World War II and all that. That's, but that period was a period of peace, believe it or not. One, two powerful nations, they cancel each other out. That's, you know, you can go here, here, but once you get to here, we got to turn around. You can go here, here, we got to turn around. We cancel each other out. We could nuke each other out. Nobody nuke each other out because they would cancel each other. So that gave an opportunity for the gospel to spread. More people came to Christ in the 20th century than ever in the history of mankind before that. Latin America, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Chile, Argentina, evangelical churches all over the all, all spread all over that part of the world. Africa, I mean Nigeria, I mean all of that. South Korea, I mean I think South Korea has like five of the largest the the of the ten largest churches in the world, like five of them I think were in South Korea. That happened because the world was the way that it was. That's not an accident. When the Soviet Union fell, the atheist, communist countries, what happened to them? The gospel. Ukraine, Poland, Russia, Hungary. The prime minister of Hungary is a Christian. Did you know that? The most powerful Calvinist in the world is the prime minister of Hungary, Viktor Orban. He talks about Jesus. He talks about uh, standing up against the Western uh, culture that wants to destroy our Christian whatever. That didn't happen 50 years ago. It happens today. The world is changing. Why is it changing? Because ask of me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance and the ends of the world as your possession. God moves the world for his glory. And everything that happens is for that specific purpose of expanding his kingdom and exerting dominion. All these verses in the Old Testament, I realized, that talked about his dominion. Why is the word dominion being used? Why is the word dominion? Um, a child is born to us. He should be called wonderful, uh, prince of peace, almighty. And the increase of his dominion shall never end. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, the Bible says. Power, dominion, and authority. All these words denote that. That he's going to exert and have dominion over the nations of the world. And so in Psalm chapter 2 is the prophecy of that. He says this. You shall break them, verse 9, with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, this is the warning, right? This is picture, uh, I don't know who wrote this. Was it David who wrote Psalm 2? David, standing in the United Nations. What is that green pulpit they got over there in the United Nations? And he's saying this. Therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth, Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. So, nations, empires, countries, you get with the program or you perish in the way. And the reason why the world is changing and the American Empire, whatever it's called, Western hegemony, what do they call it, the collective West, Western, whatever. The reason why that is going to be now kicked back a little is because all these places that were evangelized and all these places that have Christians, 
didn't just sit around doing nothing. They've been praying to God for their country. They've been praying to God for their reason. They've been praying to God for their ethnicities or communities or whatever. And God is not sitting in heaven going, well, I only listen to this group of people. Y'all are going to have to suffer and wait for now. No, 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 no. God wants to Christianize the world. So, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rearrange the world. Because the way the world is now, there's certain limitations. So I'm going to have to change the world to allow certain civilizations to rise, to allow reform and Christian influence and Christian building by these people in these places. So these folks need to be cut back. That happened during the Roman Empire, too. Germany, England, all these places were all Roman Empire. The Roman Empire collapsed. So now you have England and you have Germany. You know, Martin Luther from Germany. German Reformation. Then you have the Swiss Reformation. All those places were Roman. Not anymore. Got kicked it back. In order for this to happen, this has to be kicked back. That's the world we're going into. That's not a bad thing. Because this kingdom is going to grow. And so... We don't live in Hungary. We live here. And so, here, some, some Christians have to do building because there are places that they've never been Christian before. But some places have to be rebuilt because they used to be Christian at some point. And they've fallen away from the faith, so to speak. And so we live in a place where we have some rebuilding to do. Because the warning is, you kiss the son, lest he be angry, or you perish in the way. So, we have a job to change our culture. That's what cultivate means, right? Because our culture, we have to come to the conclusion at some point, it's not that good. And the stuff that we spread around the world is not that good. The world is rejecting what we're giving. There are parts in the world that, believe it or not, are conservative enough and are rejecting what we're giving. Because we're not, we're not promoting good things. That's American culture. I know we don't think of it that way. We say, oh, those are the liberals over there. Well, the liberals didn't come from Iran. Right? The liberals didn't came here from another planet. The liberals come from American schools, American universities, American homes. They are in American television. They are in American movies. They play now, apparently, in American sports and American leagues and go to the Olympics. That's our culture. We have to change it. We have to rebuild it. We have to reform it. And so the way that we do church might change. The little dog and pony show that we do, that may have to change. We may have to build communities because that's how you change culture. Communities, families are important. See, going to church makes you a Christian in the United States. Putting your faith in Jesus Christ Obeying all the things that he says and then raising families in that is what makes you a Christian in the Bible. Right? What makes you a Christian in the Bible? Here you go to church. That makes you a Christian. That has a limited lifespan now. That's going to come to an end sooner or later. God is going to put an end to all of this. We may not see it. Maybe the next generation will see it. But God is going to put an end to all of these little things that we're accustomed to. Because you kiss the son, lest he be angry. In fact, he actually says, he says, um, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. So we have to go from attending church to serving as Christians. Because no nation is guaranteed anything from Jesus Christ. No country. 
I don't care what it is. The Roman Empire was invincible forever in the battlefield. Nobody, nobody. It took about six weeks to collapse. No nation has any guarantee from God. No nation is more powerful than God. That God cannot put an end to it. So we, if, if, if our job here, for whatever time we live here in this side of the world where we live, whatever, you know, brothers in China, speaking of 100 million Christians in China, 300 million Christians, like the population of the United States, I think it is, right? 300 million people here. I don't know how the Chinese government can keep 300 million Christians down or for how long. Sooner or later, that's going to that's gonna end. Okay? But they're over there. And over here, things are changing very quickly, and we have a job to do, but understand, and the reason I'm telling you this, that everything that happens, this battle between good and evil, this, this battle of, of serving and kissing the sun runs through the soul of every nation. And the future of every nation is determined upon this because nothing is accident and God doesn't go around like human beings don't rule history. I got people on my Facebook telling me about the Illuminati, the New World Order, how every time they every time something goes wrong, oh that was on purpose. You know, these sanctions are backfiring, they did that on purpose. Do you really think these people are that smart? Human beings don't rule the world. God rules the world. <laughs> human beings don't control human affairs omnisciently. God does that. You see what I'm saying? Don't be afraid of people. Don't be afraid of George Soros and all these people. These are just these people are going to drop dead anytime soon. And then what? You see what I'm saying? What we fear is the Lord our God, who actually is the one who rules and controls the nations and changes them and brings about his purposes. That's whom we serve. That's whom we fear. That's whom we kiss. Lest we perish in the way. And so the future is in God's hands. God's hands. Not in fear. Not to be afraid. God's hands. Throughout all of this, God has always taken care of his people. This is the great thing about history. Rome fell and all these other empires fell. The church still went on. From Israel to Rome, from Rome to uh, the east towards you know, Turkey and eventually to Russia and then up to Germany and up to England and Spain. And other churches went spreading and then now came over here to this side of the world down to the United States, Canada, all the way down to Argentina, over back over to Asia. Over, that's the church being spreading all over the world, and God has taken care of his people. And yes, there's been suffering. But suffering here means glory in heaven anyways. And so, the doctrines that I told you at the beginning, and why the particularly the church fathers were adamant that they used to recite creeds in church. When you went to church in the early church, you recite the Apostles' Creed, or you recite the uh, Nicene Creed. Some churches, they still do it. Liturgical churches still do that. It's because to them, this was important. This is what gave sense and meaning to the world they lived in, because the world was more raw then, was more real our world is on social media now, but back then, people lived in a real world. And this doctrine, God becoming flesh, dwelling among us, the humanity of Christ, the divinity in Christ, He shares with us our humanity. He shares with the Father His divinity. We partake, He partakes of us in our humanity. We partake of His divine nature, Peter says. He bridges. You know, the, the bridge between God and man is the man Christ Jesus. That's not just justification, which is true, but it's also sanctification and life. Because he shares in our humanity. That's why we resurrect 
because he resurrected, because he became man. So he came out of the man, a man came out of the grave. That was Jesus, the man, the son of man, came out of the grave. Because of that, we will come out of the grave one day. He broke the death that was hanging over us. He broke it. So we're going to come out of the grave. Why are we going to come out of the grave? Because he became flesh and dwelt among us. He was crucified. He died. He was buried. He went down. He destroyed death. He ascended and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. How do, why do we should have the Great Commission? How do we have the Great Commission? How can we, dumb, normal people, go out into different places and bring this gospel? Okay. All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and preach the gospel. Why should I preach the gospel? Because all authority, Rome... United Nations, the United States, the White House, the Kremlin, all authority has been given to me, and on that authority that I have, go preach the gospel to all nations and teach them all the things that I have commanded unto you. And if they don't serve me, then I'll be angry, and then they will perish in the way. Go. Twelve nobodies went out into the world to preach the gospel to every creature. Because he became flesh, he dwelt among us. Because he asked the Father, Father, I want all nations as my inheritance, and I want all the, the ends of the earth as my possession. The Father was like, you got it. I, will, I gave them to you. I will give them to you. And heaven and on earth, all authority in heaven and on earth, in the spiritual realm and in the physical realm. People make a lot out of the devil. In Pentecostal churches, people make a lot out of the devil. The devil is underneath the dominion and power and authority of Jesus Christ. You understand what I'm saying? So when the gospel spreads, the devil can't stop it. Can't do nothing to stop it. Because he's under the dominion and power and authority and governance of Jesus Christ. Because all power and dominion has been given to him on heaven and on earth, on heaven, angels, uh, powers, dominions, everything has been given to him. He reigns over all those things. See what I mean? So the world is changing. It will change. I have more stuff, but it's too late. The world is changing. It will change. It has changed before. But everything that happens, understand, it will happen for the purposes of expanding his kingdom and growing his church. And there are attachments to certain things of this world don't matter because our attachment is to Jesus Christ. I understand the people that says we need, you know, to keep the United States as the most powerful. I mean, we can't allow Russia to do this. We can't allow China to do. We can't, we can't do that because we're the good country and everybody else is bad. Blah, blah blah. That's all nice human rhetoric. That doesn't mean anything. <laughs> That's human opinion. Christ rules. Christ does what he does, and Christ would change the world to whatever he sees fit to maximize the growing of his kingdom and his glory. That's all there is to it. That's not my opinion. That's what the scripture says. Whether you like it or not, that's what the scripture says. This is not jeopardy. You don't get to choose. You don't get to ask a question. You just told what it, how the world is. And you like it or you're not. And if you don't, you will perish in the way. It's that simple. And so as Christians living here, living in this culture, um, looking at how the future may be. We don't know when things are going to happen. We don't know how this is going to happen. But one thing that is that we can change is the way that we act, what we do, how we do church, how we conduct, how we train, or how we disciple our families even. Because community... No nation, 
you know, liberalism and all this woke culture and all this stuff that we see today, that's going to die. Because that has no future. You can't have, can't have a future without families. You can't have a future without families. You can't have families unless you give birth to babies. And to give birth to babies, you need a, 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 a mother and a father. So this ideology has no future. It's going to end. But if it's in the seat of power, it would crash down and the, the seats of power would crash down along with it. You see what I mean? But this has no future. This ain't going nowhere. Half of the world is already rejecting it. Half of us over here is already rejecting it. So God is going to put an end to all of that. But we got to change the way that we do things. Because the teaching of the Word of God is very important. We do an effort here to present that. Not everybody that has church on Sundays puts an effort to do that. And things will become very hard. And, com- and when things get hard, people compromise. You know what I'm saying? Like if, I, if I keep going this way and it gets kind of hard and I have to kind of compromise. You have to have guts, right? The, the, in Revelation it says the drunkards, the, the uh, you know, what is it, drunkards, uh, I forgot the text in Revelation, you know, the thieves, drunkards, whatever, and the cowards will not inherit the kingdom of God. You have to have guts. You have to be able to go through it, take the punch, Roll with it and keep up going forward. That's what it's going to take. And it's going to get like that more and more and more and more and more and more, little by little. So we have to be, you know, Tozer used to say, we, we need to, in, in the book of Acts, he says, if you read the book of Acts, that was lean, muscular Christianity before it got overweight, <laughs> right? And and soft-bellied. It was, a, it was a lean, muscular Christianity in the book of Acts. We need to start going back to get some lean, some abs. You know, that takes effort, that takes work. Because we're going to have to fight. As simple as that. Going into the future. We don't know. Maybe, maybe I'll die before any of this happens. <laughs> but that's how it is. But remember always, we have a God in heaven who became flesh who rules over the affairs of men and over the kingdoms and the nations and the countries of this world and everything that you see in the news that is broadcasted by godless, God-hating people that is portrayed as a way to scare people. Don't be scared. Because God is in control. And He will have the nations as his inheritance. Let me finish up. I want to finish the whole thing. Uh, uh, Verse 10 to 12 says this. Now therefore be wise, O kings. Be instructed. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Instructed by what? By the Lord. How does the Lord instruct people? Through his word. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your scriptures. Thank you, Lord, that from that moment in the upper room with the 120 who were gathered there, which were probably all the believers at that time, From that day all the way down to us today, your church has grown. Your word has spread. In every language, tongue, and nation that has come up, uh, your word has continued and your glory has expanded, Lord. And you have and are exerting dominion and subduing the earth for your glory. We pray for your people, for all of us here that you may strengthen us, that you may give us the boldness and the courage, that you may guide us and give us wisdom in raising our families and building communities, Lord, and 
and and and running our businesses or doing whatever that you have us do, that we may do it for your glory and for the benefit of others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.